Hello, hello, hello. How are you guys doing today? So I woke up today and I was going through my list of videos to make and I had drama about this and drama about that and drama about this and I thought, you know, I think I'm gonna take a break from the drama today and um, I wanna talk about something that is really important to me personally <clears throat> and something that I'm very passionate about and this kind of, um, this moment of clarity that I had while I was on vacation. And um, I wanna talk about sobriety today, which is something that I actually talk about throughout all of my videos on all of my channels. You know, it's, it's such an ingrained part of my life that it just kind of, you know, it comes out in everything that I talk about. And um, when you've been sober for a little while, you'll understand what that means because you, you relate everything, whether you're watching reality TV or, you know, you're, you're talking about some kind of favorite food or something. I mean, everything that um, happens in your life comes from a point of sobriety. And I remember when I first got sober, um, my counselor told me in early sobriety and also my early uh, sponsors did as well, they said that you always have to make sobriety a priority. It has to come, your sobriety has to come before everything else in your life. Because if it doesn't and you don't stay sober, then you won't have the things that you put before your sobriety. And it's probably the wisest thing that I was ever told in my sobriety. And it's the one thing that I have for the majority of my sobriety done I is I've always put my uh my sobriety and my recovery first above all and all else and um you know I've shared the story uh, I have some notes on here and this, I'm kind of going off note for a second but I, I I shared this story many many times um so anyway my sobriety birthday is December 17th of 1994 I have been sober just a little bit over 29 years and I actively work a 12-step program I have a sponsor, she has a sponsor, I have a home group, um, and I am active in a 12-step program. Even though I am active in a 12-step program, I'm very fully aware that that is not the only way to get sober. Um, and I honor and respect any way that anybody chooses to get sober. Um, and really today, <laughs> my goal in life is, in talking about sobriety or sharing my story, is just hoping to plant the seed for one other person. And um, that, you know, maybe somebody out there will find some hope and think that they can get sober too and they can have a life beyond their wildest dreams like I do. I don't really care how people do that as long as we, you know, we can slow down the dying of people to addiction. The United States is referred to as the United States of addiction because so many people are dying from addiction every single day. Um, the last statistical uh, research that I heard said that every eight minutes in the United States, an opioid addict dies of an overdose, which is just, it's, it's one of the leading causes of death in our country. And it's one that is so stigmatized that we rarely talk about. I think, you know, in this point in 2024, which is not the case when I got sober, I think everybody knows um, an addict or an alcoholic in their life, whether that person is sober or whether that person is still, you know, using and affecting your life, whether that person is a child, whether that person is a parent or a spouse or a sibling, um, a grandchild, a neighbor, a student, um, somebody that you coach, um, a friend. And I think we don't know how to have those conversations. Recently on my Peterism's channel, somebody asked me, they said, how do you um, bring up to somebody that you think has an addiction problem that you're worried about them? And I think that it's, it's, it, it's such a simple question, but it's such a deep question at the same time, right? Because I think that we're so afraid of approaching people and saying, hey, listen, I'm really worried about you. Um, your use has gotten to a point where it's not only affecting you, but it's affecting people around you. And I don't know if you're aware of that or not, um, but I'm really concerned about you. I'm concerned about your health. I'm concerned about your life. I'm concerned about your job. I'm concerned about your, you know, being able to parent people or your relationships or whatever in your life. I'm worried about you. Um, I think the one thing, um, that is so specific to addiction is that we're afraid to have those conversations with people because if we do, we're afraid that we're going to push them away. Um, and we are afraid that 
if we have those difficult conversations with addicts and alcoholics in our life, then they will emotionally punish us, which as addicts and alcoholics in active addiction, we are really good at doing. Um, and so if you serve no purpose in my life and you're going to make my life difficult and you're going to come for the one thing in my life that I absolutely love, which is drugs or alcohol, then you will no longer be in my life. And anybody that has had an ad addict or an alcoholic in their life that's actively using knows that that's the case, which is why we do things like the term enabling, which is where we give money to addicts and alcoholics, or we give them places to stay, or we pay their bills, or even so simple as never confronting them about how serious their use is. Um, one of the things that really helped me later, not at the time, was that I had a very dear friend of mine that was living with me um, probably six months before I got sober, and she witnessed firsthand, she already knew how bad my addiction was, but I don't think she really got it until she was living with me. And I'll never forget, like, she was packing all of her stuff up to leave. And I was like, hell's bells, get her out of here. I'm ready for her to go. She's taking up too much space. And I'll never forget, she said to me um, that she was like, I, I cannot sit here. Something to the effect of, I cannot sit here and continue to watch you kill yourself. Like, I can't continue to watch it, you know? And if something doesn't happen, I'm going to have to go to your dad. She's like, I don't think your dad has any idea how bad it really is. Um, my dad had a pretty good idea of how bad it was. He also was afraid to have those conversations. In fact, um, right before I got sober, he told me this later, my dad and my stepmom had sat down and they had a conversation because they didn't know what to do. And um, my uh, stepmom said to my dad, you know, you have to stop like giving him money. You have to stop helping him. He can't come over here anymore because I would go over to my dad's house and I would, you know, eat food, do laundry. And I guess I just looked like a total train wreck when I was over there and whatever. And they were very worried about me. And my dad said, um, I'm very concerned that if I stop helping him, then he'll start prostituting or he'll start stealing from people or dealing or doing whatever to, you know, meet his needs. And my stepmom looked at my dad and she said, how do you know that he's not doing that already? Um, which was an excellent point. So, you know, for me, it's always about having the tough conversations with the people that we love and offering them hope and, you know, loving them to enough to get help. But that also means sometimes having to set difficult boundaries with people. Um, you know, one of the hardest things I've had to tell people in my life when friends and family come to me and they say, I know I need to set boundaries, but I don't know how to do that with the person that I love. You know, my response to them is, well, no matter if you give them everything in the world, all the money, I, I've known people that have gone and paid their, their spouses or kids a, a drug debts who have bought drugs for them. And I'm sure there are many people out there that are watching this right now that are like, yep, that's my mom, that's my dad, or that's my you know, sister or whatever. And you think you would never go to those lengths until you're in them and, and you're doing anything you possibly can just to um, save the life of the alcoholic and the addict. You know, I've seen parents go to extraordinary lengths to just make sure that their child graduates from high school or college, you know, make every excuse in the book, call them in sick all the time, you know, on and on and on just to make sure because if they have that high school or college degree, then anything's possible. And the reality is there's a lot of addicts and alcoholics with college and high school degrees, master's degrees, PhDs, you know. Um, I have some very good friends of mine that are PhD, whatever, heroin addicts um, that ended up getting sober and we're hiding it from a lot of people for a very long period of time, you know, and it's really, really scary out there. Um, and as addicts and alcoholics, we become very, very good, you know, at um, hiding things from people and only letting certain people see certain things and whatever, you know, and, and manipulation becomes our number one language when we're actively using and things like that. It, it's terrifying, you know, and if you've ever lived through that and you're a partner of somebody or in somebody's life like that, then you know what I'm talking about. Um, I've been on both sides of the fence. I've shared with a lot of people um, in my videos and personally as well that my mom got sober six months after I did. My mom's sobriety birthday was June 2nd of 1995, so it was almost exactly six months after I got sober. My mom passed away 13 years, well, just shy of 13 years um, later. She would have had 13 years she died a month short of that, and um, my mom was somebody that didn't believe that we borrow time in recovery, which means if today I have today, I have today, I don't have tomorrow. And so I have one day, not two days, for example. And so um, at her funeral, her sponsor came up to me. A sponsor is somebody in a 12-step program that guides you through the 12 steps and um, you know helps you in, in difficult situations and things like that. And... Um, 
so her sponsor came up to me um, at my mom's funeral and she said, um, would you like your mom's 13 year token? Well, my mom died in May, so she would have been 13 years sober in, um, in June, on June 2nd, and she didn't make it. And I said, and she said, I thought you might want to bury it with her or something like that. And I said, you know, I really, really appreciate that. I said, but you know, my mom was uh, such a believer in that we don't borrow time in recovery because we should be proud of the time that we have. And whether that's one hour or one day or 30 days, or 30 years, no matter what it is, we should be proud of the time that we have. Um, and one day builds 30. I can tell you that. I know that for a fact. Because as somebody that has been sober for just over a little bit over 29 years, that 29 years was built on one day at a time. And in early sobriety, and I've shared this a lot as well, in early sobriety, <clears throat> Um, it was built on one hour at a time, you know, 15, 20 minutes at a time. I can remember sitting in my apartment and, and I have so many, I mean, I could do video after video of video after video about my experience in sobriety and my experiences before and things like that. Um, I'm not somebody that focuses a lot on the stories before I got sober, which we, we, we call them, you know, drinking stories or drug stories and things like that. Um, in recovery, we do things which are called doing leads. And a lead is when you share your story and you share what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. Um, and a lot of times when you go and you listen to people's leads, there's, it's very heavy on their drug history or their drinking history. Um, I did that for a long time. That was, you know, something that I needed to share and get out and whatever. Today, I don't really share that much about that. Um, I think we all kind of end up, you know, at, at the same place, um, for varied reasons, but the backstory doesn't really matter as long as we got here. Um, I think we all look different, come from different backgrounds, but we think the same. And so I think that's what's important. And today I share, um, when I give a lead and this is kind of like a video lead, although it's not in a 12 step program, but I share just kind of like where I'm at today and what's going on with me today. And I hope that, you know, maybe one person out there can relate to what I'm sharing. Um, you know, I shared this, like I was getting ready to say this. I shared this so many times across the board, but there were four years that I didn't attend 12 step meetings. Um, thank God I never picked up during those four years. And I was around a lot of alcohol at that time around drugs, some, not much, but I was around a lot of alcohol at that time, you know? And, um, and I, I, I left because of an argument that I got with somebody, but the reality of why I left going to 12 step meetings was because my mom passed away and I was so irrational in my anger and I didn't really know what to do with it that the only thing or person that I could be angry with was God. And I was so mad at God at the time because I was like, God, you took the one person that was the most important to me, right? And so I didn't really know what to do with that. And so I just stopped going to meetings and I used an argument that I had with somebody in a meeting as, well, after a meeting, as my reason for not going back. That person today is one of my dearest friends in the entire world. And um, right after I came back going to meetings again, um, we were able to make amends to each other. And this person is one of my dearest friends today. And so anyway, um, there were four years that I didn't go to meetings. <clears throat> and I honestly, those four years that I didn't go, I had um, no <clears throat> spiritual foundation in my life. I had no emotional sobriety. And emotional sobriety is who am I when I put the drink or the drug down? Who am I when um, I'm no longer using those substances to mute myself or to deal with my emotions or to deal with my problems? Um, you know, like I say, I, I'm somebody that works a 12-step program, but I don't judge anybody for how they get sober. One of my concerns, though, is this, is that I see a lot of people that just kind of like white-knuckle it or they just stop using or they do whatever. And I have to say, for me, get involved in church if that's what works for you or in therapy or something. Um, because to not work on that internalized stuff, those feelings, those emotions that are what lead us to use to some degree anyway, I, I believe for myself that I was predisposed to be an alcoholic and an addict. I believe I was born that way. Um, I have it just rampant on both sides of my family, but I also think that I had all these issues inside of me from growing up and the drinking and the drugging just took that away, right? So... Flash forward to the, the end of these four years where I wasn't going to meetings and I was standing right downstairs in my kitchen and um, 
it was in January. I think it was about, I just like on my vlog the other day, I was talking about this. I think it was like 11 or 12 years ago. And I was standing in my kitchen and I was making a list for the day. And I was like, do laundry, fold laundry. Um, we had carpet at the time. I was like vacuum. I got down to like the fourth thing and I just started bawling. I don't know why. I don't know what had happened. I don't know why that day, but I just completely lost it. Like emotionally, I just could not even handle the simplest things in life. And the reason why I share what I was writing on that list is to show you how just, you know, simple my life was. And I could not even handle the simplicity of my life at that point. Like it was, I was so off the rails. I couldn't even handle that. And I picked up the phone and I called my best friend, Tanya Jean who has shared a lot about her sobriety on my channel, and she's said that I can share that as well. And um, I called her and I said, will you please take me to a meeting? And she said, I've been praying for four years for you to ask me that. And um, so we went to a meeting that night, and then I started, I just like was going to meetings every single day. And for like the next two years, I was going to two meetings a day um, with the exception on Saturdays. I went to, Saturdays and Sundays, I only went to one meeting. And the, so I mean, I was going, I was in it to win it. And at that time, I was listening to a lot of speaker leads, people telling their stories online. You can find them online. You can find them on YouTube. They're everywhere. And I was listening to them and I listened to this one woman's story and I'll never forget, she said, so the term, you know, falling off the wagon means you started drinking again or using drugs again. And she said, <clears throat> it's hard to fall off the wagon when you're sitting in the middle of it. And I'll never forget that because that was the one thing that I had really never done before was I had never gotten in the middle of the wagon. And by that, what I mean is I wasn't like holding out my hand to newcomers. I wasn't doing a lot of service work. I wasn't getting really involved. I wasn't attending a lot of meetings. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't surrounding myself with tons of people that were in recovery. I had my sponsor, Tanya, and a group of people that we used to be friends with that kind of like went their separate ways. And so I I didn't really have that many people. I wasn't sitting in the middle of the wagon. And if you if you just imagine that, okay, of sitting in the middle of a wagon, it's hard to fall off if you're sitting in the middle of it. And so when I came back, what I realized was after listening to that lead, I think I listened to that on like night two, maybe, or night maybe even night one, I was like, I have to sit in the middle of the wagon. I have to like meet a bunch of people, put my hand out to newcomers. I have to introduce myself to people that I don't know. I have to start doing service work, which is volunteer work within a 12-step program. I have to work actively on doing inventory and evaluation with my sponsor. I have to work steps. I have to be in this to win it. If I want, if I want, I, I'm going to get out of it what I put into it. You know, my sponsor always says to me, how sober do you want to be? And what she means by that is how healthy do you want to be in your head? You know, um, I will say I'm also in therapy as well. I'm in marriage counseling and I'm also in individual counseling. And I have been for several, several years. There are a lot of issues that you're going to work on in sobriety that we talk about referring people to outside, um, the those are outside issues. Those are issues that no 12-step program in the world is going to be able to solve. That those are issues that you need to work out with a therapist, sometimes a psychiatrist, a life coach, a talk counselor, things like that. Um, so I do have a counselor or a therapist as well counselor therapist. I do have um, a therapist as well that I work with every single week. And, um, and then we also go to marriage counseling like every two weeks. So anyway, um, I think that's really, really important. Now <laughs> I make a lot of videos where people say I have clickbait titles. So I thought that I would just call this video today something like a sober video. And let me tell you kind of how this came about. And people are going to be like, oh my God, he's just getting into this. The intro was 18 minutes long. No, all that was not an intro. I just wanted to kind of share some backstory with you guys guys. Um, so I, um, so like I said, I got sober in 1994. I am, I have read probably the majority of the recovery books out there. Um, not just like the textual recovery books, but also like the, uh, the, what do you call it? The, uh, the, the memoirs, the biographies and things like that. And have been so moved by so many of those books. When I first got sober, I can remember reading Drinking a Love Story um, and the, the author has since passed away. And that, that book just completely changed my life and changed my perspective. I had, for the first time in my life, I felt so seen. And, um, through the years I've read other books that have just like phenomenally, uh, were phenomenally written and profoundly changed my life. A couple years ago, uh, my best friend and I, we both read the book Blackout, remembering the things I drank to forget. It was fantastically done as well. And so I, I've read all those books. I've seen so many movies 
And um, I'm always looking for a, a new, good uh, recovery movie. And if you're looking for a documentary that's fantastic, about a year ago, I watched um, this documentary. It's on Amazon Prime, and it's called Bobby Joe, and it's fantastic. Um, and it is about this woman that got sober, I believe, in Kansas City, and she turned her sobriety into starting halfway houses in Kansas City, and I think she's built something like 60 halfway houses. It's just, it's absolutely unbelievable. Um, so I would highly recommend in that movie. But there's so many movies through the years that I've watched. When a Man Loves a Woman, I love. Clean and Sober is probably one of my favorite movies of life. I love recovery movies. And Clean and Sober actually was one of the movies that like really helped me in early sobriety. I think When a Man Loves a Woman came out after I got sober with Meg Ryan and she gets out of treatment. Her husband's Andy Garcia and Philip Seymour Hoffman um, is in it as well, sadly. Um, sadly because, you know, he passed away later. And, um, He's phenomenal in it, and it just, it really shows, like, the bonds. It also shows the importance, I think, of sister programs like Al-Anon and Naranon. Al-Anon and Naranon are sister programs to 12-step programs like Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, Heroin Anonymous, Marijuana Anonymous, and they're programs for friends and family members um, that you work your own program. You don't go to, like, Al-Anon and Naranon, and they're going to tell you how to fix your alcoholic or addict. They're going to go there and tell you how to fix you. They're going to go there and tell you how to work work on issues as you relate to the world as somebody that has an alcoholic or an addict in your life. And When a Man Loves a Woman was one of the very first movies that ever talked about that. Um, Andy Garcia attends meetings in the movie, and it's really profound in him sharing his story and how he's affected as a spouse. I would really recommend that. So recently, I have been wanting to watch some recovery movies that I hadn't seen, ones that I hadn't seen, because i basically seen all of them, you know? And so, at this point, it's just, it's really hard for me to find recovery movies, and I actually, I, like, just Google search, and I put in, like, sobriety movies, and, like, every third or fourth one was something that I had never heard of before. Well, that's not true. About every third or fourth one was one that I had heard of, but I hadn't, like, ever seen before, because it just was, it had a little bit to do with addiction, but on everything, and then, like, every eighth or ninth movie was something that I had never heard of before, like, some, like, I don't know, D-list recovery documentary uh, about Christmas at a halfway house, but trust me, I will be watching it, because I love anything to do with recovery, and so, when I was going through there, 28 Days with Sandra Bullock came up, and I was like, oh, I love that movie, I forgot about, you know, 28 Days, so, I kind of, like, put it in the back of my mind and was thinking about it. And then, when we were getting ready to go to Florida, I always download shows on my iPad to, like, watch on the plane and whatever. And I had downloaded 28 Days because it was on Netflix. And I was like, okay, well, I'll watch this. I haven't watched it in a couple years. It's been several years since I've watched it. And, um... It's funny what I remember about that movie, like, and then watching it and what I what I remember. But I was like, I'm going to watch this movie 28 Days and I haven't watched it. Well, I didn't watch it on the way down there because I was catching up on Survivor and Amazing Race. And so, one night, it was like the second night that we were in Florida, we went to Ultra Music Festival. So, we went to Miami. We go down there, like, every year in March. And we go down there for Ultra Music Festival, which is an electronic dance music festival. It's like 100,000 people there, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And um, it's just, it's so much fun, you know? And I can remember going. This was, like, I think we said this was, like, our 10th year going. Uh, well, we haven't gone consistently because they were shut down one year. And then there was, like, another year that we didn't go. But 10 years we've been going since 2014. And, um... You know, I can remember the first year that I went, which would have been when I was 41 years old, because I'm going to be 52, so that would have been, you know, when I was 41, and I can remember thinking to myself, I don't want to go, I'm going to be so old, whatever, and going, and there being people that were like 60 and 70 at this thing, and it's so much fun, and I love it so much, and Friday night, I danced the whole night, and then it got rained out, and so we came back, maybe that was the night that I watched it, and then Saturday night, we went over there, and I danced for seven hours straight, I took like a 10 minute break, other than that, I was dancing the whole time, or walking, and and then Sunday, it was the same, seven hours. And, you know, I just felt so alive and I felt so invigorated and so inspired. And um, I just felt so grateful in that moment. And so I came back and I was watching this movie, right? I was watching 28 Days and I have some notes. And I was looking over the skyline of Miami because we were staying downtown in Miami. We stayed at the, uh, the Kempton Epic downtown. It's right in the middle of downtown Miami and it overlooks... Um, like the, the intercoastal and things like that. And I had this moment where I was like, 
And I have these moments a lot, honestly, I really do. But I have this very specific moment where I kind of like paused the movie. I was sitting there watching the movie and I kind of paused it. I was like looking over and I was looking at like boats coming down. It was like, you know, two o'clock in the morning and boats are coming down the intercoastal and it's just absolutely beautiful. And I'm like, man, life is so good. Like, life is so good. Like, my old sponsor, I got that phrase from him that he would say, I have a life beyond my wildest dreams. I have a life beyond my wildest dreams, you know? I can remember when I first heard him say that in a meeting, and I was like, isn't that like a song from the Moody Blues, or a line from the Moody Blues or something, you know? And I was like, and now, like, and he would just say it with this glow on his face, you know? And now, and... and and I've lost those sponsors in the last two years. You know, they've passed away. And, and I, I say this a lot in videos that I've lost so many people to addiction. But one thing that I, I want to make very, very clear, it's very important to me, is that there are people that live full lives and die sober. My mother died sober. She's very proud of her sobriety. It gave her her life back. Um, I have two sponsors, one that I had for 12 years in my sobriety, that passed just in the last two years. And they both died sober. You know, my one sponsor had over 40 years of sobriety. And um, people die sober every single day. I focus so much attention on talking about the, the you know, ad addiction epidemic and people dying from addiction because it breaks my heart and it's so sad. But I think it's also important to note that people die sober. People live sober lives every day. You know, there's a saying that we are not a glum lot. We are having a lot of fun. And I think one of the things that I was so terrified of when I first got sober was that the fun was over. I can remember thinking like, well, if I ever get married or if I ever do this, maybe I'll drink. If my mom ever gets sick and dies, I'll drink. I made all these excuses in my head for reasons why. And all of those things have happened and I haven't drank, you know, and I haven't used, you know. I got married and I didn't drink. My mom passed away. My mom was sick in the hospital for three months. I never drank. She would have hated that, you know. That was the one thing that she asked me at the very end. She was like, please don't ever drink again, you know. And um, she knew what she was doing with that, you know. And, um... I've had probably, like, I put this thing out while I was on vacation, and I said, I'm having more fun now than I was when I was 25. And that's the truth. At 51 years and t years old and 29 years sober, I am having more fun today than I have ever had in my entire life. And to think that one of the things that was keeping me when I had no money, no education, no work experience, no friends, my family didn't want to be around me, I didn't care if I lived or died. And the one thing that was keeping me in it was, well, I don't know that I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I might not have any more fun if I get sober. What's going to happen if I get sober? Then I'm not going to have fun anymore. And I was so afraid of that, right? It didn't matter that I didn't have any friends in my life. It didn't matter that I didn't have any people that cared about me, or they cared about me, but they could only care about me so far because they, they all thought they were going to die. You know, I had birthday with a birthday lunch with my dad a couple years ago, and we were sitting there talking, and I said something to him about my sobriety, and I said, do you think if I had kept on using, and he didn't even miss a beat. I didn't even get the rest of the sentence out, and he said, you'd be dead. And I go, do you really think that? And he goes, 100%, Peter. He goes, do you not remember how bad it was? He said, you would be dead. You would have either died in prison or you would have died from something to do with your addiction. Period. End of story. He goes, the fact that you never picked up using heroin, and it, one of the reasons why I didn't was because it wasn't really that prevalent when I was using. If, if I was using today, I can tell you 100% that I would be an opioid and a heroin addict. I know that because I was a garbage pail user. I would use anything that you gave me that would make me feel better or different. And so I would have used anything. I know that that was my road. I know that. Had I not got sober then, if I was using today, you know, I know that, you know. There's all this discussion over gateway drugs and, you know, what gets somebody using. I think the first thing that you start using consistently, is whatever that is, you know, I have friends of mine that they never drank and they smoked pot first and that's the thing that got them started. You know, cigarettes and nicotine were probably a huge part of my addiction. You know, that's probably the thing that got me started because I can remember seeing images of my mom with her friends drinking and dancing to Thelma Houston, you know, and holding cigarettes. And I wanted that image. I wanted to drink and I wanted to smoke, you know. And so that's kind of what got me started smoking cigarettes. Not my mom, you know, but just that image of that freedom, that fun. I wanted that in my life, you know. I so badly wanted to feel different because I didn't like how I felt inside. And then when I first took the drink, the drink took me. When I first took the drug, the drug took me. And there was no going back after that. 
um, it was just, it was off to, off to the races. There was, there was no turning back. Um, and that's my story. That's what happened to me. I can remember being at my elementary school and it was like sixth grade and I was with one of the only friends I've ever had. And he and I met some girls up there and we were swinging all night long and we had all brought alcohol and stuff up there. They're all three puking and I'm swinging on the swings. Like I cannot wait to do this again. I can remember the, how glorious the stars looked and that what alcohol did to me it did something different to other people, you know? And the alcohol took me. This is gonna stop, hold on just a second. Okay, I'm back. Um, you know, people ask me today, they say, if you could go back in time and never have been an alcoholic or an addict, would you change those things? And it's such a difficult question, right? <clears throat> it's like that movie Sliding Doors. And it's like, you know, there's one, and I've thought about this so many times, you know, like there's one, this one life that Peter Mon has where he goes down this, you know, road and he never uses, he never drinks, he never uses drugs or anything like that. You know, goes to college. When I was in high school, I wanted to be a fashion designer. I actually applied to several fashion design schools and got accepted to it. Um, so, you know, that was one road. And, you know, I think certain things about myself kept me from really doing things I really wanted to do when I was younger. I think, you know, had I not been so afraid and I think had I not been so into my addiction in high school, which I was very good at hiding in high school, I think that I might have been involved more in like choir and drama. I think that might have been my road a little bit. I don't know, you know. And then there's this road that I go down where it's filled with addiction. And the thing is, is that when my mom was alive, she said something to me, I think I was about two or three years sober, and she said, you know, you're so much wiser than I was at your age because of what you've gone through for your age and what you've learned and the fact that, you know, you have a lot of friends that are older, that are sober and things like that. And she said, you look at the world in a completely different way than I ever looked at the world until I was like, you know, 40 or something like that. And I never really understood that at the time when she said that to me. I just thought, you know, whatever. Um, but I think that's kind of the thing is, that I've looked through my life, you know, for the last 29 years, with the exception of the four years that I didn't go to meetings. Um, and even then, I still did, you know. I, I still very much was proud of my sobriety, even though I really wasn't doing anything to stay sober. And it's interesting because at that time when I got sober, my friend Tani would say to me, I don't know how you do it. And it didn't seem that difficult to me. And, you know, in retrospect, I think to myself, I don't know how I didn't pick up back then. And honestly, I don't really know why I didn't. I mean, it wasn't like I was, you know, getting anything out of it. Um, and so and I do want to share this earlier to say that when, um, you know, about putting uh, my sobriety as a priority, when I came back in and I started going to meetings again, after that first night, I had a conversation because I knew after that first meeting back that I was back and I was in it to win it. And I sat my husband down and, you know, our marriage was not great at that time. And I've shared that a lot about us going into marriage counseling and things like that after that. And um, I said to him, I said, okay, I need to do this thing. I'll never forget, sitting right here in this bedroom, I sat him down and I said, I need to do this thing. Like, I need to go back and be with my people. Like, I need to work on myself. I need to fix parts of myself that are broken. I need to figure out who I am and all this kind of stuff. And I need to actively be working on my sobriety. And I want to go back. And he was like, okay. And, you know, my husband was somebody that we met when I was like 13 years sober. He had never witnessed me using and stuff. And in fact, there was one point he really didn't get it. And so I reached out to, I mean, you talk about links that people go to. I reached out to probably like 20 or 30 people that I used to actively use with. And I messaged them and I said, can I ask you a favor? They were all like, I mean, every single person was like, yes. And I said, um, you know, I'm with my, you know, new boyfriend. This was before we were married, I think. And I said, he has really no idea, like, why I need to say so. Because he didn't really get it at first, you know? I mean, he got it. He respected it. But he didn't really get it. And I said, um, you know, could you maybe write, like, just, like, a small, like, paragraph or letter on why you think it's important for me to get sober? And I thought everybody would write back. And they'd be like, well, I don't really know. I don't remember Peter using at that time. I mean, because you have to remember, at this point, it had been, like, 13 years since I had seen a lot of these people, you know? And I'm finding them on Facebook and whatever. I mean, we were friends, but on Facebook. And, like, every person that wrote me back was like, Peter 
was the scariest person. I was always afraid for his life. I was so worried about him. Um, he would go home with people that we didn't know. You know, he would just disappear in the middle of the night. He was always intoxicated every time. I mean, every person. It just was like, I was like, I kind of was reading these letters. I was like, not one person thinks maybe I didn't have a problem. I mean, that's, you know, with my dad saying it, then all those people saying it. And Alex really got it after that, you know? And that was at that point, I think we were about two years into the relationship or something like that. And Alex was really like reading, you know, the, the basic text and really understanding about recovery. He knows, he's known my sponsor. He knows all my friends are sober. He's friends with them as well. Um, and so that's been something that's been really, really important to our sobriety or to my sobriety and to our love story, I think, is that he understands that, you know, and people ask me a lot. They're like, um, does it bother you when Alex drinks around you? Does it bother you when you go places when there's alcohol? So in my early sobriety, I'd say for my first year or two, I don't think I could have been around a lot of alcohol. There was a long time before I ever stepped into a bar, and I was told not to do that by the people that I was surrounding myself with, and myself with in early sobriety, my sponsor and other people like that. They would say, you know, if you hang around a barbershop long enough, you're going to get your hair cut. And so I didn't go to those places. Today, I don't feel that way. Um, and actually, we're told in recovery that if you have a reason to be someplace, there's no reason for you not to go there. And take somebody that's sober with you and go there, right? I don't really have those things today. I will tell you this. If my husband having a drink or having a glass of wine, and I have a lot of friends of mine that are sober that feel the exact same way. If, I mean, I have friends of mine that are sober that have, their spouses have full bars in their house. We do not. And that, it's whatever choices. And then I have friends of mine that they don't have any alcohol in their house. So it's kind of a personal decision. But, you know, one of the things I've realized over time is that, Drinking and drugging is but a symptom of other issues that are going on with me. So if my husband's having a glass of wine and I am so craving that glass of wine and I am, I mean, it's, first of all, it's not going to be about a glass of wine because one is too many and a thousand is never enough. I mean, it's going to be that glass of wine and then two bottles of wine and then whatever else I can find. And then it's like, it's, we're off to the races, like I said again, right? So it's not about that one glass of wine. But if that one glass of wine or somebody having a beer, somebody doing something like that is so bothering me, then I need to really take a look at what is going on inside of me that's setting that off. Because it's really not about the craving at that point. Now, in early sobriety, I think that's a completely different story. When I was in early sobriety, like I said earlier, you know, there would be 15 or 20 minutes where I couldn't even go without, you know, not craving, like physically craving. I was going through physical cravings. And I can remember I would have all of my drug dealers' numbers, you know, like out on little pieces of paper. And then I would have all these numbers of people that I met at meetings. And I would call these people that I met at meetings. I'd be like, hi, this is, I was so shy, you know, I'm still so shy in my personal life. I know it's hard to believe, but I'd be like, hi, this is Peter. You told me I could call you. And they'd be like, hey, Peter, what's going on? Like, can I help you? And I would be like, yeah, like I'm really wanting to use. And I'd like look at, you know, my clock and I'd be like, okay, it's five o'clock. If I can make it till six and I can go to the liquor store at six or I can whatever. And, you know, just those people walked me through it and they helped me and they came and sat with me and they came and got me and took me to Denny's and Perkins and Steak and Shake and IHOP and places like that, you know, and, or meeting and we got through it. And, um, and that was really it. It was, you know, just one moment at a time, just one day at a time, you know? And I'm going to talk about that here in just a little bit. And that, because these slogans in recovery really, really helped me in early sobriety. And, um, but I came home, you know, from going to that meeting that night. And I said to Alex, I said, listen, I said, I've got to fix myself. And by fixing myself, I'm either going to get sober and well, I already was sober, but sober minded. I'm already, <clears throat> I'm either going to get healthier and I'm going to be okay, or I'm going to get healthier and we're going to be okay. But either way, I have to be okay. So whether our marriage is saved through that or not is okay. And he was so a hundred percent supportive of that. And, um, I, I'm so forever grateful for that. Cause I think in that moment, our marriage wasn't good. I didn't know what was going to happen. And I thought he could just up and leave. And I was kind of prepared for that, if you want to know the truth. And actually, <clears throat> that couple days after that, I had three, because we were going out to bars a lot. And I decided that I wasn't going to go out to a lot of bars anymore. I just didn't need to be wasting my time in places that I had no fun being. I wasn't really having fun, you know? Every once in a while, when I go out to a bar now, I have fun and dance and whatever. But we were going out a lot. And there was, I was just standing there drinking, you know, Red Bulls and Diet Cokes. And I wasn't having a lot of fun. But there were three people in, um, that I was going out with a lot. And I called each of those women and I told them that I was no longer going to be going out a lot anymore. And two of those women, sadly, I don't really see them anymore. Um, 
they were very supportive at the time and were like, oh, well, we'll continue our friendship and whatever. And that didn't really happen. I think them going out was really more important than them maintaining a friendship outside of a bar. And the third person was my friend, Melissa. And I'll never forget, because at that time, she and I didn't even actually go out that much together sometimes. And she said um, to me, she said, I am 100% here for you. And however she said it, I don't remember. But she said, and this is just going to make us stronger. And it did. And it made our relationship 100% stronger. And she's one of my dearest friends today, you know. Um, and I just had to come from a point of honesty. And I think, like, that moment of coming back in and just sharing with people. I haven't been to a meeting in four years. I haven't been doing shit. I haven't been taking care of myself. I haven't been going to meetings. I haven't been calling my sponsor. I haven't been doing anything. I've been hanging out in bars. Just saying that to other alcoholics and addicts, being like, I've always been taught to live out loud and telling myself where I'm at that day. And just being able to say those words was like, whew, it was like this huge exhale, right? But I sometimes forget like what the early days were like. And so I'm watching this movie in Miami and I had this moment where I was like, God, life is so good, you know? And, um, and I was like, thank you, God, for my life. Like, thank you, you know? I'm somebody that, we talk about prayer and meditation a lot in recovery, and I do have a higher power in my life. And um, I interchangeably call my higher power God. And, um, but it doesn't, I'm not somebody that goes to church, which, hey, that's fine. My mother went to church. She was very, a woman of strong faith. I respect anybody and their religious or spiritual beliefs as long as they don't hurt or condemn other people. Um, and, you know, but for me, my spiritual, which that's a whole other video. I've talked a lot about it on my vlog. My spiritual beliefs come from many different places. And it was actually a huge journey of my sobriety. And, um, but, you know, we talk a lot about prayer and meditation and recovery. And for me, prayer is having conscious conversation with my higher power. And just talking to my, to my God, you know, and being like, thank you so much, God, for being able to see this beautiful skyline and dancing with 100,000 people and all this kind of stuff. You know, just, it's amazing. And I'm like sitting there and I'm watching. So I turn 28 days back on and it's a scene where if you've seen the movie, Sandra Bullock and her roommate are making chains um, of candy wrappers and they're making like these necklaces and eating candy because one of the things is when you first get sober, you like crave sugar like nobody's business. It's a true story, right? I mean, it's absolutely 100% true. You crave candy like nobody's business. And this moment like really reminded me of all of the connections that I made in early sobriety, you know, and the ones that I still make with people today. And I just, I was like, I am so blessed for all the stories and all the people that I have met along the way, I mean, it has been an absolute blessed journey. It has been a blessed journey, you know, and I've met so many people along the way. And I think watching that movie, what it reminded me of was that, you know, it was so hard for so long. And I can remember saying to myself so many days, I'm going to wake up and tomorrow when I'm going to drink as much as I can, do as much of this as I can, do as much as I can. When I wake up tomorrow, I'm starting afresh. And I tried that over and over and over and I couldn't. Even after having gone to treatment, I still couldn't do that. You know, I couldn't do it on my own. And um, it was so hard. And so when I went into treatment, I was terrified. I was scared, you know, and I've shared my treatment experience a little bit on different videos. I can do a whole video about that if anybody wants to hear it. But, you know, I was so terrified about going into treatment and like it was, you know, and I, my dad looked at me and said, you know, you can go to jail or you can go to treatment, but I'm done with you. And I was not stupid. I knew that I wasn't going to make it in prison or jail. So I was like, no, I'm going to treatment <laughs> as any good addict would do, you know, and I went to treatment and I didn't want to be there either either, you know? I didn't want anybody controlling my life. But watching the movie, like, one of the things that I totally forgot and I think sometimes I take for granted was how difficult the early days were, which is why it's so important that for those of you in early sobriety out there that you're so proud of every hour that you have, every day that you have, every two days, every week, every 30 days, you know? It's so important for you. I can remember when I first got sober and going to meetings and we, you know, in sobriety we celebrate 30, 60, and 90 days, um, you know, six months, one year, 18 months, and multiples of years. And I can remember, like, people getting, like, let's say 29 years like me today, right? And I'd be like, they are so full of shit. Like, there is no way they are sober 29 years. But the people that have, like, 60 or 90 days, like, I was like, I want that. Oh, nine months, too. I was like, I want that, you know? And I can, I can, I can maybe stay sober for 60 or 90 days. That's why it's important to share our stories, right? It's so important to share our stories. Um, you know, and I remember being in treatment and 
the, at this one point, my counselor said something about, somebody asked about the statistical rate of people staying sober, and she said something like 1 in 30. My counselor today is still one of my dearest friends. And she said something about 1 in 30 make it. And I can remember, like, counting around the room, like, in my head. We were, like, in some lecture or something. And there was, like, about 30 people in this room. And I can remember th saying to myself, I'm going to be that 1 in 30. I didn't even really have a real desire to stay sober at that point, but I knew that I couldn't continue to go on living the way that I went on was going on living. And I was like, I I've got to do something. I was like, I'm going to be that one in 30, you know, I'm going to be that one that makes it. And, um, you know, after we would get, we got out of treatment, those of us that all went through treatment together over Christmas and New Year's. There was a meeting on Sundays at the treatment facility. It was called the breakfast club meeting. We would meet there every Sunday, you know, and, I can remember, like, getting out that first week, and it was, like, all of us there at the donut counter getting coffee. And we're like, hey, how are you? It's so good to see you. And it was, like, a reunion of sorts. And then the week after that, it was, like, a few less people. And then I remember I just kept on going, you know, until it was, like, just me, you know. And um, today, out of that group that I went to treatment with, and it was my fifth treatment, today out of that group, I don't know where most of the people are. But I know that there are um, two other men that are sober today. And we are all in separate programs. And um, we've all been sober, um, continuously sober since that time. And, um, you know, I think three out of 30 is a pretty good statistic. It makes me sad. But I'm grateful for it, you know. Um, I don't know what happened to those other people, you know, that I laughed with in rec therapy or had turkey sandwiches with, you know, in the cafeteria and watched movies with in the lounge. I don't know what happened to those people. Um, I hope some of them got sober. I, I hope many of them, I hope they all got sober, you know? Um, I was thinking the other day about this woman that I went through treatment with because I ended up working at the treatment facility that I went through treatment at. And, um, there's this woman that I went through treatment with and she went through like four times later and then she became kind of like a pillar in the recovery community. And, um, you know, I, she was in a different program than me and I haven't seen her for several years. And I was thinking about her the other day and I thought, you know, she had such a pro profound effect to me. And I was like going in wanting to like find where she was and whatever. And she had kind of a unique name. And so it was easy to find her. And she had passed away several years ago and she had passed away sober. And I think that's an important story to tell. You know, I can remember thinking like she was... The first person that I ever saw read the book, Drop the Rock, which is about character defects. And um, I can always remember that book because of her and these funny things that she would say, you know, and she'd always give me so much hope, you know, and, um, and so, you know, I hope she knew, um, and she died sober and I hope that she knew that she really impacted people's lives and I never got a chance to tell her that. I don't think we tell people that enough, you know, and they think that. Addiction, you know, rips at people's heartstrings and, and tears people apart, and tears families apart that we don't really get to tell people sometimes how much we love when addiction is involved, you know? Um, years later, after the counting of the 30 people, uh, my counselor, who, like I said, I ended up working with her, and then she and I have become, we've been dear friends ever since then. She said to me one day, well, so they were getting rid of my... Uh, they were getting rid of my, uh, what do you call it, my file. And and so, because like after so many years, you know, they get rid of it. And so she called me and she said, they asked, you know, they asked me if I need anything from your file because they're getting rid of so many files so I had to go through them and whatever. And she said, um, I just wanted to know if you wanted to like ask anything about the file or whatever I can sit down. Because you can like request to sit down with your counselor or whatever and go through the, the file. And I said, is there anything that I need to know in there that I would want? I kind of was laughing with her, right? And she was like, no. And she said, but I will tell you this. And I, at the time, I was probably 10 years sober. And she said, but I will tell you this. And I'll never forget this because she started crying. And she said, I never thought you would make it. She said, it's always the ones you never think are going to make it that make it. She was like, I never, I never thought you would make it. She's like, you were so angry and so resistant and you challenged everything, you know? And, um, and I did, and I did, you know? And, um, I don't know. I don't think that's why I'm here today. I think that made my road a little bit more difficult, but I'm still here, you know? And, um, and so on this trip, I was talking to my best friend, Tanya and, you know, she... <laughs> 
had asked me, you know, she was like, as soon as you land, text me and then call me when you guys get out to the Uber. And, you know, my friend Valerie always says that. And my sponsor says that. And I have, like, you know, my cousin Caroline says that. And Alex's mom asks that. And, you know, I have people in my life today that want me to contact them when I land somewhere and let them know and let them know that we're home from a trip, you know, and that we made it back safely. I didn't have that. I had people that didn't want to take my phone calls because they knew that if I was calling them, I wanted something from them, you know, or wh whatever. But I didn't have people that, I had people in my life that loved me, but I don't think they knew how to love me. Um, and I, uh, well, because I've had people in my life that I didn't know how to love. I love them so deeply, but... The, you know, people say things to me all the time. They're like, you know, they'll reach out to me and they'll say, I heard your story in a video, blah, blah, blah. I love my so-and-so so much, my spouse, my kid or whatever. Like, why can't they stay sober? I love them so much. If love were enough, there would be no reason for 12-step programs, MAP programs, therapy, you know, God, whatever. I mean, there would be no reason for that if, God, if love were enough. Love is not enough. That's why we have to set boundaries and set limits with the people in our life that we love that are addicts and alcoholics. It's the only thing that's going to change. It's the only thing, you know? And like my friend that I was sharing earlier with that said that to me, years later I looked back and I thought to myself, she's the only person that was willing to tell me what I needed to hear. She was the only person that was really willing to put it on the line and say, I give a shit enough about you to piss you off. And she did. And I was pissed at her at that time, you know? Years later I reached out to her and I said, thank you for being the one friend in my life that was willing to say something to me. She was the only person that was willing to say something to me at that time, you know? And I'm grateful for that. Um, and so I have people today in my life that care about me and love me genuinely. You know, not because they're worried that I'm going to end up dead or calling them for bail, but they're genuinely worried about me. So I've been buying these uh, sobriety t-shirts recently. I thought, you know, you got 29 years sober. You can start wearing the sober t-shirts. All the kids wear them, right? You get them at the sober conferences and things like that. But I got on Amazon. I bought this one, Sober AF. I have one that says sober. I just bought a couple more that are probably coming in the mail. They might have come today. I got a bunch of Amazon packages. But I love them so much. And it's interesting because whenever I wear them out in public, people say things to me. And um, they'll say things to me like, are you a friend of Bill's? Or like, oh, I think I know you from a meeting. Or, oh, I love your t-shirt. They'll go like that to me and stuff like that, right? And um, I only have one person while we were at Ultra Music Festival. One girl, I have this t-shirt on. I think it was this one or the one that says sober. And she was like, boo, like that. But that was the only person. Other people were like really friendly about it and stuff. But I have this t-shirt on that says, just for today... And that's a recovery saying. And um, I love this, the slogans of recovery. They got, you know, they helped me. I, those were things I could remember. And I shared in a video not too long ago, one of the things I love, one of the sayings I love is, if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. And I have to remember that, you know? And so I was out with my cousin Caroline on Cousin Fun Day, and I had my Just For Today t-shirt on. And this guy stopped me. I had to go back in somewhere, and he stopped me, and he goes, can I ask you a question? And I go, yeah. And he goes, I saw you across the store earlier with your t-shirt on. And I was like, oh, thanks. And he was like, what does that mean? And he kind of, like, looked at me real strange and kind of smart. And I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, I go, are you a friend of Bill's? And he goes, that's kind of like a, a saying that... Let's you can let somebody know if they're in recovery. And I saw you a friend of Bill's. He goes, I am. And he goes, Oh my god. He's like, Where did you get that T-shirt? I was telling him where I got it. And he goes, Can I tell you something? And he's like reaching down in his pocket, and he's like, Today's my birthday. And he had something like thirty nine years or something. And I was like, Oh my god. And you know, we meet people all the time that are sober and sharing our stories. You know, and it just, it's the coolest thing in the entire world. And I love that today. You know, um. She's watching the last part of the movie of 28 Days, and it's where she sees the gay guy in the plant store, and, and they're told in the movie about relationships. They're told that, you know, if you can keep a plant alive for a year, then get a pet, and then if you can keep a pet alive, and at the end of two years, if your plant is alive and your pet is alive, then you can get into a relationship, <laughs> and this gay guy's standing in this plant store, and he's crying, right? And he's like, the plant is dead, and the dog, and so he, he sees her in the store, and he's like, I didn't kill the plant to the guy, and he goes, he's holding his dead plant. And he looks at her and he goes, I didn't kill the plant. And he goes, and I don't even think my dog likes me. And it just was like such this moment. It's a shared experience that we have, you know, in sobriety. Where we really get each other. You know, like we really get each other on like a deeper level. It's just, it's absolutely amazing. And, um, 
and I'm sitting there, I'm like crying like I am right now as I'm watching this, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, like my sponsor used to say, I have a life beyond my wildest dreams, you know? And sometimes I forget that. If I wake up and I have food, you know, and a place to eat and a place to lay my head and a cup of coffee, that's enough. Like that's so much more than I had 29 years ago. That is so much more than I had, you know? And I remember the last day that I got out of treatment and my sponsor or my counselor saying to me, you know, that if you do this, this will be the hardest thing that you will ever do, but no one will ever be able to take it away from you. And I'm still here. I'm still here somehow. I am still here. I don't know, you know? And I share this a lot, but um, when I was in treatment over New Year's, there was a New Year's dance every year, and I really wanted to go, and I wanted to get my hair cut because I wanted to get a guy because a guy was going to fix all my problems. If I had a cute haircut, then I could get a guy. So I went to my counselor, who's my friend today, and I said, can I get my hair cut or have my hairstylist come in here and cut my hair? And she said, no, princess, and since you think you're so unique and so different from everybody else, you can stay back and you're not going to go to the dance. And so I stayed back and I watched the ball drop on TV and whatever. And in the cafeteria, they would always, like, put out lunch meat. And this is going to stop in, like, five minutes. And if I get into the story, I don't want to stop it. So hold on just a second. Okay. And in the cafeteria, like, at 10 o'clock at night, they would lay out, like, lunch meat to make sandwiches and chocolate chip cookies and all this kind of stuff, right? And so I, at the time, had a friend of mine bring me in all the Michael Crichton books, like Jurassic Park, Sphere, all those, Disclosure. I was reading all those books. And I got through them all. And then so New Year's Eve, I knew they weren't going to be back from the dance until like three or something like that. So I went up to the counter and um, I said to the guy at the counter, who I ended up working with later and has since passed away as well, sober. And I said to him, I said, yeah, I'm out of all my books. Do you guys have anything to read? And he threw down the basic text. And he goes, yeah, why don't you try reading the first 164 pages of this? And I was like, oh my God, how dare he? Like, you know, like be so harsh with me. So I wanted to share this with you because I've shared this in a lot of meetings that... This one paragraph, which is the very end of page 164 of our basic text, changed my entire life. And um, somebody was kind enough to needlepoint it for me. Is the name on the back here? I can never remember who did this for me. Um, they needlepointed this for me years and years and years ago. We have it in our bathroom downstairs. I see it every single day. And it has my last name at the top, and it has my sobriety birthday. 12 17 1994 and then it has my birthday birthday my belly button birthday june 29th 1972 and underneath here it says and this is the last paragraph of page 164 abandon yourself to god and i read this a lot and i say this a lot when i um share my story abandon yourself to god as you understand god admit your faults to him and to your fellows clear away the wreckage of the past give freely of what you find and join us we shall be with you in the fellowship of the spirit and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. And I can remember sitting in the cafeteria as it was snowing outside on New Year's Eve, 1994, going into 1995. And I did not know what the road of happy destiny was, but I knew that I wanted it. And I knew that I was not happy. I was sick. I was sad. I was lonely. Nobody wanted to be around me anymore. And I knew my life was over as I knew it. And I did not know what that road of happy destiny was. And I didn't even know what the word trudging meant. But I knew that I wanted to walk on that road. And if there were other people that were happy out there and they were sober, then I had to find them. And I had to do what they did so that I could be like they were. And I could be happy too. And that's why it's important for me to share my story because I want other people out there to know this isn't really so much for the people that are already sober. And I always, whenever I do these videos, I encourage people to share their sobriety birth dates in the comment section below. Share how much time you have, whether it's a day, a week, a year, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. Share your sobriety um, birthday. I don't care how you stay sober. Share it in the comment section below to inspire other people. This video is really not for... Um, anybody out there that's already sober, we all have, you know, different stories within the same spectrum. We all kind of share the same story to some degree, which is why my counselor said, you think you're so unique. Um, this isn't really for anybody that's already sober. This is for anybody out there like me during those fo four years that couldn't find their way back in and was so scared to walk back in. And I can remember going and being so afraid of what people would say to me. And I was going to this speaker meeting. I, w I wouldn't go back to my home group for a long time, which is a meeting that you go to on a regular basis. You make a commitment to. And I was going to this speaker meeting. And this friend of mine that's probably 15 years older than me 
he came up to me and he goes, I noticed that you're not going to um, our home group. And I was like, yeah. And he goes, Peter, people love you. We want to see you there. And, I, you know, I always have just been welcomed with that. And I know that that's not other people's experience. And my recommendation for you would be find find meetings if you're wanting to go to meetings. Find meetings until you find that that there. Not every meeting that I've ever walked into in my life have I felt that kind of love and acceptance. But I would say the majority of them I have. Um, but I'm doing this video for the one person out there that is struggling to find their way back in or has never found it to begin with. Um... Every day I say a prayer for the still suffering alcoholic and addict out there that will never be introduced to sobriety because there are people out there that will never hear of it. They will never know of it. Um, they will never know how to find their way out there. And so for anybody out there that's watching this that thinks maybe it's time, you never have to have your story match somebody else's. All you ever have to have had is enough. And you know, people ask me all the time, well, I only drink this much or I only smoke this much weed or I only eat this kind of pills. Like, do you think it's enough? Whatever. It's never mine to define whether or not somebody else is an alcoholic or an addict. That's for you. Um, you know, try it, you know, try sobriety for a while if you think it might be your road. And for the one person out there that's watching this, that this is hitting you like a, a, a you know, a pound of 10, br 10 bricks, maybe now's the time, you know, and you can do it. Um, I'm going to make sure that I get this last part of my notes correct. We say you never have to use again if you don't want to. You can stay sober. We do recover. We do have amazing lives. We cry. We laugh. We have barbecues. We go to music festivals. We dance. We go to funerals, but we also go to weddings. We have relationships. We have friendships. We live lives just like everybody else. But today, we're living. And that's an amazing thing. I love you guys, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.